Hello and welcome to Jason Newland. Not dot com. <laughs> I nearly said not com. Dot com. My name's Jason Newland. I still got a little bit of a cough, so I'm very behind on my new timetable. I do apologise, but. Uh, I just, like last night I was going to make a recording, but I was so tired, and I just ended up going to sleep. So, uh, and it's, <clears throat> it's not very easy to make a recording during the day, because it might be quiet, but then I kind of expect in some, uh, sounds to arise which is just normal because it's daytime people are doing things so I'm not going to moan about it but uh, what do I normally say oh yeah only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes and this is let me bore you to sleep see everything's in the wrong order so I've got this new timetable. I've even written it on a board. I've got a page on my website. I've, you know, I tried to make it all official-ish. And if you know me, you know that official isn't really my my game. I don't really do official things. I like to. I like the creativity, the flexibility, to just do as and when. I feel like it really so I'm, th I'm thinking of getting rid of the timetable so I might actually make more recordings that way I'm not sure however at the moment the timetable stands at Monday sleep hypnosis weekly I want to try and stick to that one because it's called Sleep Hypnosis Weekly and sometimes I go two weeks without doing one. So that's not good. Um, what's Tuesday? Deep Sleep Whisper Hypnosis. Wednesday is Relaxation Hypnosis for Stress, Anxiety and Panic Attacks. Thursday is Let Me Bore You to Sleep which is what I'm doing now, although it's now Friday, but don't tell anyone. Friday is... Um, <laughs> so this is Wednesday. I suppose, is it Deep Sleep Whisper again, isn't it? Deep Sleep Whisper Hypnosis, Saturday would be... I don't know, but it's one of them. I, isn't it really weird? There's only seven days to remember, but I, it took me about six, six or seven years to learn the days of the week. So I'm not, I shouldn't give myself too much of a hard time. I've only had about five days to learn it. The uh, new timetable. When I was at school, right, and I did go to school, we used to have timetables. Um, and every year at the beginning of the year because I was at high school for five years uh, well I had yeah five years so from I was a 1981 was my first year so that's September 1981 that started September 1982 my second year of high school so I was 12, 11 for the first year, 12 for the second year. I only just turned 12. So when I was at high school, some of the other children uh, we were all... So when we first started the first year, most of us would have been... At the end of August, we'd all have been... 
the same age as far as like 11 but come September some of the other kids were 12 before they even got to high school and then they were turning 12 in September, October, November I had to wait all the way to the end of August before I was 12 it wasn't fair so I was the youngest I'm not sure if I was the youngest in the whole school because I didn't do a survey but I'm pretty sure I did I did ask around I did I did have a little a little uh okay I did do a survey I did a survey and I was the youngest they're happy I did a survey didn't want to really go into it but I did I did some research and I was the youngest in my year so in uh, when I first joined high school at 11 I was the youngest person in that school apart from the tortoise that was in one of the classrooms but mind you, that tortoise might have been older than me, mightn't it? Who knows? Hmm. And I... The third year, I was 13, just before. So I was, I was born 26th of August, that's my birthday. For those that want to send me birthday presents and cards. Because and, I only got... I think I got three birthday cards last year. Last year? This year, rather. This year. What was it for? I got one from my dad. Still got them up on the thing. One from my dad, from parents. One from my, my little brother. And one from another friend. Which would be... Diasara, yeah. So I had three birthday cards. And you know what's weird? It's, it, honestly, I got a text, or it might be an email, wish me a happy birthday from my dentist. Seriously, my dentist remembered my birthday and took the effort <laughs> to send me an email, but no one else. I was like, wow, apart from those three. Is it three or four? Three, what, yeah. Three birth. I'm not moaning. Well, I am, aren't I? Really, I'm moaning. I'm moaning. To be fair, though, I do get hundreds and hundreds of birthday wishes on Facebook, so that's nice. But uh, physical cards. I'd like to have some physical cards. Um, the reason I say that is because I got a physical card today. So this recording is dedicated. That almost sounds like it's a. Uh, bereavement doesn't it dedicated um, to a flourishing lady called Molly and I just want to thank Molly right now for sending me my very first Christmas card and I don't mean ever I don't, you know I have had Christmas cards in the past they're also still up. I got well, I got four last year. So this is a happy Christmas from Australia, and there's um, a little kangaroo, teddy bear. It's the cutest little thing. It's a koala bear. It's got little boots on. He's very happy. He looks a bit like me with his little belly. Like it's holding his belly. But kind of content, you know? Kind of happy. Some like cuddly, someone you want to cuddle. Just like me. And big ears, just like me. And so this is my first Christmas card, or any card. No, it's not the first card, but it's the first Christmas card. Is it the first Christmas card? Hmm, let me think. 
No, I, for, I did get a Christmas card. And I have had another card. So I've had a couple of people send me cards in the past, but we're talking over nearly 14 years. So it's only happened a couple of times. So this is pretty sure this is the first Christmas card I've ever received in the post from um, someone that listens to my recordings. I don't want to use the word fan or follower. It sounds a bit, you know what I mean, a bit kind of weird, but um, <laughs> stalker. No. Um, appreciator. That's a nice word, isn't it? Appreciator. Someone that appreciates what I do. And Molly, I really appreciate you for this card. And you do say that you you don't imagine that I would uh, be able to resist opening the present. And I didn't. I did. I did open a present. Well, it's two presents. So actually, it was this morning. I got a knock on the door, and it was a post lady. And she handed me a parcel, and I thought, "Ah, uh, I didn't know women were allowed to do that job." <laughs> I'm joking. I said, "Ah, uh, I did. I really didn't." I wasn't expecting anything because I've literally spent the last week waiting for deliveries, things that I've purchased uh, for the flat, trying to do some DIY. Um, it's... Uh, I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it's not, it's just not, it's just, it's just not really, not really happening, not really happening, but it's, anyway, that's another situation, and so I've got these tools, and I've got all these little bits that I've been getting, and um, I've asked my dad to help me out, to show me how to do it because I just don't know it's I just I don't know what goes in which hole honestly and I like to say it's the first time I've been in that situation but I've never been much good at drilling and you know those kind of things and uh. anyway Molly thank you very much so what I did I've got this parcel And I thought, what on earth is that? And I also had some letters as well. And one of the letters, letters, one of the letters is telling me that I'm having my front door replaced. So I've got a date for that. I'm having my front door replaced for a brand new, be silly if it wasn't new, wouldn't it? I replaced it with, you know, a bit of cardboard or something. That wouldn't really be ideal but it's uh, it's going to be replaced <laughs> they came along and said yes we're replacing it what, what are you replacing it with this new fangled invisible door it's amazing you can't see it honestly it's absolutely wonderful the good thing about it is if someone is at your front door and they knock they ring your doorbell you can actually go and you can see them. You haven't even got to look through the peephole. You can just see them there, the whole of them. It's very high tech. Oh, okay, excellent, yeah. So I take my door away then. Great, thank you. And uh, what about the key? You, that's the good thing about it. You don't need a key. You never have to open it. You never have to close it. It detects when you're coming through and the force field just removes itself so you can walk through it. Absolutely fantastic technology. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Yeah. Can I speak to a supervisor, please? 
like you know what I did the other day uh, I was on a bus I might have mentioned this I don't know but in my last recording but I was on a bus and I was waiting I was just on a bus just sitting there bus was moving along broom broom all that quite a busy bus it's half term no it's not half term it's or is it half term yeah it must be half term because it's not Christmas so it's half term and it's uh, Halloween so they we had half term this week for whatever reason like for the, ch- the children and the the buses were busy at times and I had to go into town a couple of times this week and uh, so anyway there was a busy bus I got a phone call I got my head, headphones in I got a phone call come through so I look at my phone and it's just a number I mean I don't recognise a number but I answer it I'm, I'm a good I'm a good guy you know I'm, I'm, I answered it and it's someone saying hello I said yeah hello it said uh, we're calling about the about the accident you were involved in so this is a scam straight away they're basically randomly calling people out of a phone book or a list or a computer system just dials a number for them I've worked in that environment unfortunately in the past and a long time ago not not scams but the same kind of phone-in system but this is an you know phoning someone randomly just to, to and but not to ask them if they've had an accident but to talk to them about the accident they've had assuming they have is enticing someone to who knows what anyway i said i, I think i said it a little bit too loud because i have my headphones in i said sorry i can't talk at the moment i'm on the toilet doing a massive poo bye and uh, so I just hung up and there was this lad in front of me and he just started laughing now I don't think he heard me say I'm on the toilet I think he just said I can't talk right now I'm doing a massive poo he thought I was doing it on the bus or something and I, and I said uh, I think at the end also it said yeah sorry about that speak to you soon bye dad or something like that at the end of the conversation and uh, he couldn't stop laughing and he, he says <laughs> so that was a bit weird because I always, I always do that if I get a phone call from someone trying to sell me something um, I just make something up it's just standard isn't it because some people are rude to people that do cold calling I don't, I'm not rude to them because I've done cold calling I know that it's a hard very very hard job so I, I, I'm not rude to people but I will say silly things to them until they hang up so at the very least they've had a little bit of entertainment rather than people being rude to them because they do anyone that does cold calling has non-stop rude people it's just how it is it's, that's the that's the name of the game unfortunately and uh, although I the last time I did cold calling was in 2001 and it was selling mobile phone contracts for Orange I think it was not orange, not oranges, the fruit. That was a uh, oh god, itchy crotch. Wait a sec. Oh. Hmm. 
and I yeah so I had this job and it's basically reading a script and it's very weird uh, interesting as well environment because it was a job that everybody knew they could lose any time you know there was no job stability at all because of the the nature of the job you had to get a certain amount of people say yes um, to the contract so they did they get a brand new phone for free but then it'd be signed into a contract for a year or two years or something like that and they get the latest Nokia 400 whatever it was at the time and at that time it was quite a new thing for the vo um, phones to vibrate it was like a new thing and the internet was what was it WAP 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 W-A-P and it took about 10 minutes for a picture to upload <laughs> it was awful <laughs> the internet was really really bad on mobiles back then and mobiles are going through a through a, a period where the smaller the phone it was the better like they just made them as tiny as possible and but at the same time they had people that were using them for business so like I think you had the Blackberry I think the Blackberry was around at that point although I didn't get my first Blackberry till 2007 I think and it was just you know it's, I used to see in London I used to see doormen and these big tough men pull out their the phone and be going do 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 what's it? Do 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 whatever it was, you know, the old uh, Nokia tune, and they'll pick it out and they'd literally be holding it between their thumb and their finger, like trying to pull the little lid up. Hello, who is it? What do you want? Ooh. And the tiny little phone. It was funny, honestly. I'm sure I saw someone pick it up and. It was so strong, he accidentally pushed his finger and thumb together, and the thing just turned to dust. The phone just d evaporated. It was uh, untrue. So I said this script that we just have to say to people, you know, uh, calling, calling on behalf of. Orange, um, got this contract, and it's really groovy. And you should have this phone because it's a really good phone. What kind of phone have you got? I bet it doesn't do what this phone does. This one vibrates, yeah, vibrates. Oh, and you can kiss it, it's a very lovely kisser. And it's just like, you know, this had things we had to say now I I played around with the script and um, I created a script that worked so that I got more people saying yes than the others and so what I did is I kind of figured out how, what was working, what wasn't working. And after about a month, I was number two on the sales board out of, I don't, there wasn't that many people working there, but probably about 40, 45, 50, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, maybe 40 or 50. So I was number two on the list, the top of the list of uh, sellers but what was different between me and the other people is I wasn't selling as many but I wasn't getting people returning them so the top seller should, should get 
of her phones returned because I had no idea what they was what they were buying, what they were saying yes to. All I knew is I think they just liked talking to her. Um, or I don't know. Or she was very convincing, but for whatever reason was, I mean to to be fair, I don't know what effort she put in because she used to be reading books and everything while she was doing the job at the same time. But she was a top seller. And so she obviously was really good at what she was doing. Yet she had 50% of her sales, 50% of the phones returned. And she was still the top seller, so it just shows how good she was. But I had very few of my phones sent back. And they couldn't figure out how. They were trying to kept listening to me and I think, how how come you're not getting the phone sent back? I said, because I'm groovy. And they said, no, really, how? He actually called me in, the, the boss called me in. Why <laughs> why aren't people send it's like it wasn't like it was more a case of why aren't people sending the phones back? They were surprised. I said, why would they send them back? They're good phones. So I kind of, it's as if I was the only one that actually believed in the product. They were good phones. They were top at the time, top of the range. And the contracts are pretty good as well, really, for the time. I knew, I was kind of quite into phones back then. Because I owned a few, I think, by that point. Let's have a quick drink there. It's quite good the cough goes after I'm talking for a while. Which is nice. So. I've got no idea how I got onto talking about selling mobile phone contracts. But anyway. Very strange company. It was in Romford, not Romford. It was in Romford, it was near Romford. Something Hill. Not Romford Hill. I think it was just past Romford. God, it was a hospital nearby. So I used to go there and have my dinner sometimes. Um, Harold Wood. Harold Wood? Uh, that'd be the right word? Harold Wood? Possibly. Because I went... I'd been there previously. I think it's Harold Wood. I was there before because I, uh, I was dating a Spanish girl who was an au pair there in the hospital grounds. She she was an au pair for a doctor that lived in the, the grounds of the hospital. So I'd been there before. Harold Wood. I'm sure it was. And it was a train station, which is handy because it was a long walk otherwise. And I used to get that train from... Um, it's really weird I can never remember the name of this this uh, train station only 16 people a day use it but it's still there it's between Forest Gate and Stratford Maryland station that's it Maryland And if I'm correct, I used to get the train, but it used to go the opposite way. So it didn't go towards Stratford, because that would have led to Liverpool Street. It went the opposite way, so I went through Forest Gate. And then, I'm not sure about all the different stops, but it went through Ilford and Rumford. And then... To Harold Wood, is that the right place? And I was there 
and there's a little bit of a walk to to the job to the office but it wasn't a long walk probably about a 15 minute walk from the train station and the person that I was God, what is his name because I started with one person we trained together the training was I think it was probably half a day's training to be fair it wasn't I can't believe this I put these new socks right I'm talking new last week or the week before there's a massive hole in the heel of them I can't believe it. Six pairs for a pound. You'd expect quality, wouldn't you? There's a massive hole in the heel. I've only worn them twice. I mean, I washed them and then worn them again. And I got two packs of these. They weren't a pound, actually. They were four, four ninety nine for three pairs of socks. They're supposed to be fourteen pound apparently. That's what it said on the back of the box. So what six pairs of socks. So these ones I sort of worn them all, washed some of them, and now I'm wearing these and there's a hole in them. I ask you I don't understand. Where's the pride in sock making these days? Where's it gone? I remember years ago, you'd buy a pair of socks. It'd last. It'd last more than two weeks. Unless my feet are just so stinky they just dissolve the material but I don't think that's the case I'm not saying I've my feet are perfect or anything but they don't, I don't think they particularly no I'm not talking about feet. my feet are, my feet are lovely are lovely feet I don't know if they're lovely their feet they just yeah they're just feet but oh, I can't believe that some things are just unbelievable don't you think a hole in my socks I should let it go I understand that but I'm struggling with it. I really didn't expect that. Things are easier when you kind of prepare for them. That I was not prepared for, and it just comes as a bit of a shock whilst I'm actually making this recording. I didn't see it coming. <sighs> Need to do some relaxing exercises. So, I did some weird phone calls in that job. One of the weirdest phone calls I think I ever did was, I phoned someone up and I said, you know, I used to get quite to the point, like I'm phoning on behalf of E, uh, uh, whatever it was, Orange. I said, uh, I phone in to offer you a free phone and um, the man who I spoke to on the phone said oh okay can you wait a sec and it went muffled and he said listen can you phone me back in a couple of hours um, I'm just burying my brother I'm burying my brother it was at his brother's funeral and he and then he hung up. 
Now, I don't know if he was doing what I do to people that phone me. Well, actually he wasn't because I did phone him up and he did take the phone. But that's the kind of thing that I would say to someone, possibly. Not usually funerals, but, you know, I do some big, long, convoluted, pointless story. I know it's hard to believe that I would uh, do anything like that, but sometimes I do. Sometimes. What other thing? I like some of the people were funny that I worked with. There was one bloke and he was so menacing on the phone. I think he, he, well, I don't think he did. He scared people into accepting the phone. But he didn't do it in a, um, he didn't threaten them, he just, the way he spoke. <laughs> it was like, or phoning from, or phoning from, uh, on behalf, from, I don't know, was it Orange? We've got a new phone with a contract. It's, uh, it's a Nokia 624 miniature, blah, blah. Well, I need your account number and sort code. <laughs> Just say, okay, there you go. I, I think it would, I think he'd say, I'm sending you, I'm sending you a, uh, a free phone. And um, it was just like, wow. I couldn't quite uh, imagine doing that, really. Uh, but he was, he got, he had a lot of success with it. Um, what other ones did we have? There was a flirty lady, young lady there with me. And because I used to move around different tables and I don't know why they used to just move me around. I think it was because of the, f the farting. They just didn't, they, they kept, I think they thought it was, it was a fart. There's a weird smell which seems to follow him. <laughs> that Jason farty Jason and uh, they um, there was this I say young I was what was I I was 30 at the time so it was the it was the summer 2001 sort of probably May June time and so I was, well, I was whistly, whistly, wasn't I? I was 30. And there was this young girl there. She was probably about, honestly, I don't know, maybe 18. I really couldn't tell you how old she was. But she's one of the most flirtiest young things in a workplace that I've known. I've known a few, but she was really... I can't tell you what she was doing, but I was just like, I didn't know what to do with myself. And then her dad would pick her up, and he, he looked younger than me. He'd pick her up from work in his van, and honestly, he looked younger than I was. So, I was like, ah. Oh. So it's just, but, she's very funny. But, um, yeah, it's a, uh, I should I should move on, but it was one of those. I don't know why. I just remember it. I can't even remember it in there. There's a few things I remember about that office. One was it was incredibly hot, and they had these extractor fans that were like these portable extractor fans that they'd stick out the window, and they looked like they could fall out and hit someone on the head. They really you. When, you, when we went outside at break time, no one sat underneath them because they looked so unsta unsteady, you know. 
the other thing I remember is walking in on the morning and seeing my name number two on the sales list on the top sellers like that felt nice and the reason it's not yeah it's ego but it's not just that I spent from 1988 all the way through the 90s reading sales books can you believe it I actually had an aspiration to be a salesperson to sell and to make lots of money which never happened the money bit didn't happen but it's just I used to read these sales books because I used to do window double glazing canvassing knocking on people's doors when I was 18 and I was it sounds like I'm just bragging doesn't it saying how good I was at stuff I think I spent enough time saying how rubbish I was at stuff as well haven't I in these recordings I think I'm allowed to say a few nice things about myself but I was quite I think I was quite successful at that. Um, just knocking on people's doors, and we was working. What was I doing? Probably the most I'd ever earned in a week. At that point, I was eighteen. Nineteen eighty nine. It was. I was eighteen. It was in the summer. So I was earning more a week than I'd ever earned before. And I was doing less hours than I'd ever done before. So I was starting working probably about four in the afternoon. Maybe five till about eight. That was my hours. Monday to Friday. Sometimes we'd do a Saturday morning. And that's all the hours I did. And we were getting not just the the basic. So it, it worked out I was getting about £25 an hour. Um, but we were also getting £25. Oh, no, that's not right, is it? That's an exaggeration. <laughs> um, six, seven, eight, five. So three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. It's about fifteen hours a week I was working if we didn't do Saturday mornings. Saturday was every now and then. So fifteen hours a week, we'll get paid extra for Saturday. And we were getting paid for six hours, I think, a day. So, I think I was earning 150 or 120 a week, maybe, basic, maybe 150, 120, 60, which isn't a lot of money, it's a, it's a 615, what does that work out at, 15, 120, times by 15 we divided by 15 so 10 hours is £12 an hour isn't it so 15 hours but 10 hours is £120 so that would be £12 an hour 15 hours so £8 that work out about eight pound, eight or nine pound. So still more than the average wage now. Still more than the average hourly wage now. Thirty odd years later, the average wage then, like hourly rate, you'd be lucky to get two pound an hour. So you know, for like low paid jobs, 
throughout the 90s I was getting, in fact in 1989 and 1990 I had a factory job that was paying £1.80 an hour then it went up to one ninety an hour <gasps> I was dribbling I was and then eventually it went up to £2 an hour and £2.10 I think 2004 I think it went up to £2.10 an hour <gasps> oh so you know back in 1989 when I was 18 the thing is the £120 a week was just the basic that was about the commission and if you don't earn commission you don't have a job that's the basic thing with sales you have to if you don't make any sales you ain't a salesperson therefore you have to leave or you get kicked out so no salesperson gets the basic for very long just the basic before they you know it's, it's kind of obvious isn't it really I suppose so I I think the, the most I earn I think at that time was about £185 a week I think that was my best week and although it might be two, over 200 which was an absolute fortune to me back then and that was a I know two hundred pounds not a lot of money these days for what you can buy with it, you know, but back in nineteen eighty nine when the most I'd earned in a week probably was probably less than a hundred pounds at that point. Maybe maybe a hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty pounds. You know, I wasn't earning more than maybe four or five hundred pounds a month when I was in a factory in 1988. To suddenly be earning, you know, getting onto 200 pounds a week. Plus, we were getting these prizes. And because it was, uh, we worked for different companies basically my boss was um, I don't know how to explain it he's, he's dead now but he was um, a crafty little devil I think is the one way to explain him he he was making money for us but at the same time he was making more money for himself so he's very clever, very, very clever in what he did. But he made sure that everybody was happy. So he made sure that he only had the best people working for him. Which meant that the, he also would sell. He'd go out and sell some of the windows. So he'd save the, be <laughs> he'd save the best leads for himself. And he'd go and sell the windows and get paid 25% commission. So it's like, you know, because he was a, he was a double glazing salesman for 30 years or something, and very successful. And when we met him, or when I met him, he was probably in his, must have been in his late 60s, 70s. And he used to be a pilot in the, in the RAF during the, the last war, the Second World War. And he was just so... It's so many stories, and he had this big moustache, a proper uh, old-fashioned RAF moustache, that he clearly wasn't, he was allowed to keep it when he left the RAF, basically, when he left the army, RAF, whatever it was in, when he left the war, he was allowed to keep his moustache, and uh, he took it home with him, and he kept it, he wore it wore it every day and his name was Jeff and he had this big gap with literally about four teeth at the front were missing and I think sometimes he had false teeth and sometimes he didn't but it didn't stop him smiling he smiled and 
he took me under his wing a bit because there was only a small team of us but we we were good at what we did and we did exactly what he wanted we got exactly what was needed so he was happy we were happy and it was probably the best summer I've ever had because I was earning money and I had freedom there was a lot of freedom there a lot of and I was living I was kind of blossoming and I was writing comedy you know I kind of just keeping the journal and I was reading sales books and getting drunk still just things that 18 year olds do I was uh, kept winning uh, champagne so I used to spend a bit of time drinking champagne on the beach to be fair that would probably be on a Sunday or Saturday and Sunday because I couldn't do it during the week so I was working but I did it couldn't go to work drunk not sure anyone would have noticed to be fair but uh, sometimes because I lived across the road from where he lived Jeff my boss so he used to pick us up and I think I used to go to his house and then he'd pick the others up on the way to wherever we would be going and he sometimes he'd invite me for dinner so his wife would I'm not sure if I think it was him I'm not sure if it was him that cooked or she that cooked all I know is phenomenally lovely beautiful food and I go into his home and it was immaculate everything was perfect like really expensive furniture and antiques and it was it was a retirement home that they were living in because they were both retired but he just yeah it was just like I loved loved going there and even now I can kind of get that sense of that smell of the food because I was living in a little room yet again like I have did for 30 odd years different rooms and I wasn't really eating because it was a family house there's lots of people there so um, and I had money so most of the time I was eating out so I'd have I'd go to a cafe every day and have my lunch and then in the evening probably have a pizza or uh, go to the garage and get a sandwich or something like that so to have like a, a cooked meal cooked with love was really nice and it'd tell me all about sales and you know the techniques and it it um, I don't know I think it rubbed off on me but it took a long time before I got back into sales ridiculous I went through the entire of the 90s and his 90s as well I think I went all the way through the 90s so from 1989, so I went for 90, 91, 92, 1993, 1994, 1995, 1996, 1997, 1998, 1999, 2000, and then 2001. So 12 years later, I started my first proper sales job. So all, of, all the way through the 90s, I could have been doing sales I just didn't believe in myself isn't it weird the thing is I did actually get quite a few sales jobs over the years during the 90s but they were all 
apart from one no they were all commission only yeah they were all commission only I think which was un, just undoable I, I, you can't work commission only well I couldn't work commission only because I needed to pay rent buy food and I was never able to go more than a week or even a few days really without money coming in needed to have, to have money so I had um, I had a few sales jobs that didn't last there was one actually in 1990 yeah 1990 it was the back end of the year so it was near the end probably November time and I had this job and it was selling um, I forget the name of it now but apartments but share you know timeshare and I got a sale and they changed their mind so I think they they were read the small print or whatever and when they went to sign the contracts they changed their mind which was a bit annoying so close but I, I quite liked it but again commission only and at the time I was working part time and I was earning enough to pay the rent and buy my food so this sales job was only it wasn't full time anyway it was just I think in the afternoons so I thought I'd give it a go got nothing to lose and I did and I did <laughs> I uh, lost I only, only lost a few days and my uh, bus fare really to be fair but that that was okay but didn't it would have been a quite a well paid job actually had I have sold but but so I left that one I didn't bother with that anymore what other sales jobs have I had I probably had more than I remember I can't remember I sold till rolls yeah till rolls I did that for about a week but I quit that because again I did get some sales to be fair I think I think I did but it was just hard and I was just sitting in a room basically chain smoking and everyone was just there doing the same and I didn't enjoy it and also I was selling a product that I couldn't I don't think I could ever get excited about the product till rolls you know the, the roll that you put into a till that prints out your receipt there's a limit to how excited I could get about that and the only thing to really the benefits was um, I couldn't find, maybe price quality I, I don't know and also most people when I phoned them up they thought I was trying to sell them toilet roll which I wasn't what other ones jobs did I have um, wow there's been a few but I forget them oh wow I had a job selling tickets to the Henley Regatta and I'm really struggling to remember it but again there was no pay it was 
commission only and it was literally just phone numbers out of a phone book just here's a phone book phone people up I'd forgotten all about that and it was about selling companies just talking to companies and selling them uh, like a a cruise not a cruise that, was that the Henley I don't know a cruise or some kind of thing for the Henley regatta I'm not even sure what a Henley regatta is I used to know but it's in Henley and it's something to do with regattas and uh, so I didn't again that would have been really good money it was one of those jobs that if I'd have sold um, a package I'd have made maybe £500 or £1,000 or something on the sale because they were expensive products they were the thousands and thousands of pounds worth of product but I I quite liked the idea of it because it was a bit bigger you know it was the money was there I could kind of taste the money a little bit you know see the well actually there is an opportunity if I sell I'm going to make good money you know and people were walking in and they had some of the people who worked there had suits like really expensive suits uh, briefcases walking in and they were clearly successful for doing really well at the job and I'm guessing, in hindsight, I'm guessing that some of those people probably had ongoing clients who maybe would come back to them the next year and they'd sell them another package. I don't know kind of how it worked, but they were earning a lot of money. But I just couldn't afford to get there. So that's another one that I didn't do. I did about two days or three days of it. Oh, what's another one? I did. Sure, I did one in East London. Can't remember what it was for. Unless that's the one. I'm pretty sure the Henley Regatta one was in Embankment kind of area of London. Sales, um, sales, sales. I did some canvassing in 1989, 1990, 19, yeah, beginning of 1990, I did some canvassing for an insurance company, and um, so that was knocking on people's doors in the evening, and I think that was commission as well only I did it and it was for a, uh, a proper insurance company and it might have been house insurance or life insurance I don't remember I did it for one night and then I thought no well, I had another sales job <laughs> they're all flush they're flooding back to me now I had another evening job um, and it was selling well actually it was given away I wish I'd stuck at this one because there was money to be made but I didn't realise at the time it was giving a, letting people have a sky dish satellite dish for free for a month or two months or three months something like that and if they didn't like it 
it'd just be taken away. If they did like it, they'd get a chance to keep it and it'd, you know, they'd have all the programs and all the stuff that comes with the package. And again, this was back in 1990. But uh, they, a lot of people didn't seem that interested. I didn't realize that Sky was gonna go on and be the big company that it is. Because at the time, it was kind of a bit of a joke. And it sounds weird, but you know, the, the press were constantly mocking Sky and the sky dishes and the sky stuff because it was it was it wasn't terrestrial television and i don't think that the mainstream media liked it very much so but um i finished there could have been some good money earned there eventually and then 1990 in april I started doing accounts, um, not counselling. I started doing the because I was working in a factory in London, and in like one eighty an hour. And I spoke to my friend, my former boss, who did the canvassing, because the company we worked for took a break they'd stopped having canvases and decided to spend money on advertising and he told me that they decided to get canvassing again and he asked if I'd wanted to go back so I moved back there and I was getting paid what was that probably about the same amount of money £120 a month uh, a week or £150 a week, something like that. And so I did that, and that was going well, did that for a little while. Then I got a job in a factory uh, on night shift. And I was earning good money doing that as well because the night shift paid a lot more than the day shift. So I was working from like 10 to, I think it was 10 to 6, 10 in the evening to 6 in the morning, going, going home, going to bed, getting up and starting work at probably 4 o'clock till seven or five till eight something like that eventually I got rid of the the canvassing because it was a little, just a little bit too much because I had enough sort of focusing plus I they were asking me to do overtime in the in the full-time job sometimes and you know so I had to give that priority but it's really weird, I went from earning less than a hundred pound a week in a factory working long hours sometimes all the way through the winter eighty nine to ninety in really freezing cold conditions because I was in a freezer basically or a big fridge that was keeping everything frozen. So it was quite a hard graft, you know, job at times. And then suddenly I'm earning 300 pound a week, or if not more, it's like, huh? It's really weird, isn't it, how things turn around. I'm just trying to think of any other sales jobs I had, because I had three insurance jobs, selling insurance, back, you know, 2001, all the way through to four or five years ago. Um, 
other sales jobs. No, I can't think of anything. Sure there was. I just can't think off the top of my head. But before I go, again, I want to say thank you to Molly for the card. Thank you for the after eight mints, which I will be eating. And also for the book that Molly sent me. It's called The Dinkum Dictionary, A Ripper Guide to Aussie English. The Dinkum Dictionary would bring a brown dog back to life, will put hair on your chest, will stir the possums, an immensely comprehensive collection of the words we really use. That's from Stephen Murray Smith, Lenny Midge Johansson. A ripper guide to Aussie English. So I will be dipping into this book. But because I haven't made a Let Me Bore You to Sleep session for a little while, I thought I'd do a catch up. But I haven't really at all because I've not talked about anything much about what I'm doing now. But that's okay. So. You take care of yourselves. I will speak to you very soon. Remember to be kind to yourself. Because you deserve to be happy. Lots of love.